There is no other place, I believe, throughout the year of high thought leadership than at the Deer Industry Conference every year. And this week I've been down in Timaru and uh, I'm joined uh, at lunchtime here with Julia McKenzie, who's farming at Braemar Station near Lake Tikapo with her husband Hamish. And it's great to be able to catch up with Julia at amidst the news that's been very hot lately in the media on intensification in the Mackenzie Basin. Julia, firstly, can you give our listeners and viewers a bit of an understanding of your farming operation and where you are, how long you've been there? Um, we farm on the edge of Lake Pukeki. Uh, Braemar Station is just over 4,000 hectares and it's a dry land property, um, although we're in the north, north west Bain Shadow, so we get quite good rainfall and we're on quite heavy soils. So we farm Perindale sheep, uh, red deer and Angus cattle. We actually finish our lambs um, without irrigation, so it does just go to show how diverse the Mackenzie Basin is, as opposed to what is sometimes portrayed. Sometimes we all believe it's just a dry land desert, but there are areas of the Mackenzie that are actually quite productive and really good farming country. So you haven't spoken yet, but we will have your presentation online. And the big theme this week's conference is around environmental stewardship. Is it something that you have been doing a lot of up until now, it just hasn't been recognised, or is there a plan in place and a lot more still to do? Um, there's always more to do, but I think it's just kind of been inherent in the way that we farm. Um, we're on a family farm, Hamish's parents bought it in the late 60s, just prior to Lake Pukeki being raised. And at that time, Braemar lost its whole productive farm and Carolyn Duncan started again. On, the, um, on what was left. So they spent their lifetime building, um, you know, every plant, every tree that you see on Braemar has been planted since that time because, as I said, the whole developed farm went under. So um, the property that we, we are lucky enough to farm has had a lifetime's work by Hamish's parents and it's up to Hamish and I to, to enhance that, to ensure that we have a viable uh, business so that we can look after the property and also then the hope is that we will be able to pass it on to our next generation. So therefore the environmental stuff is um, really important because in, in today's world um, it's, there's a lot more of a, um, people are more interested in that uh, and so therefore we need to be showing that we're caring for it whereas in the past we just were. So um, now we're, in, we're getting really involved in doing farm environment plans and um, making sure we're writing down our thoughts and our, our goals so that, it, that we can um, have something tangible to, to talk about how we do things. What's the most frustrating thing that you still don't have enough science around to understand um, leaching when it comes to uh, other forms of livestock farming such as deer, sheep and beef that it isn't strate strategically just dairy? Um, I think the whole technology side of it is, uh, is the regulations are almost getting in front of the science and, and I feel that people are making uh, what, what are seen to be easy policy decisions and, um, and like 30 second sound, sound bites, um, you know, we're going to put a cap on this, we're going to do that, when they're not understanding the science behind it. And, and to be fair, none of us do at this stage. I mean, it's evolving constantly. Um, and especially in like sort of relatively low leaching environments such as ours, uh, you know, we haven't got a full handle on, on what, we, what we're doing because we are you know, we're doing, our, our, our biggest issues would be the E. coli and the phosphate, phosphorus and deer, um, that would be our biggest impact and you know the, the easy easy way out around that is riparian planting and, and keeping stock out of waterways, but on our property as extensive as ours, to keep stock out of waterways would cost an arm and a leg um, and it would be for very little benefit. So it's more about, for us, it's about monitoring and, and making sure we're on top of any issues as they come up or as we notice them. And when we're talking in your environment, this is a subalpine, a hill country environment, high country environment, um, but what have you been able to achieve with deer fencing off waterways and those sorts of things? Deer are known as being quite destructive on the environment as opposed to sheep and beef? Uh, just in the Deer have a 
behavioural thing where they like to, to wallow in water and, and it helps them shed their coats and, and it's a behavioural thing and it, and it helps them um, relax and it's, it's just part of what they do. So you can't take an animal behavioural trait away from them. Um, but it's a matter of getting them to do it in the right place and not in connected waterways and things like that. So, so wallows and paddocks that are not connected um, are pretty well fine. And it's, it's where they're doing it in small streams and things like that that are the problem. So they don't do it in stony bottomed creeks, they do it in mud. Um, so it's making sure that there's good filtering on the property um, and that there, there are blocks below the deer farm where only sheep have access and there's, and there's sort of wetlands that the water's filtered through to slide right down before it ends up back in, in any significant waterways and providing good alternative stock water. Yeah, sure. And you're sitting, the Lake Pukeki, for people who are not familiar with the name of the lake, is that famous lake where people stop in the middle of the road <laughs> to take photos of the beautiful Mount Cook. I mean, the Ikailo levels from tourism is, is not going to be an issue around the most scenic place in New Zealand? Um, oh, the thing about Lake Pukeki is it's an incredibly big lake um, and the impact of tourists is probably not so much on the waterway, it's probably on the side of the road and just making things slightly unpleasant and the rubbish. Um, and yes, I do run a tourism business as well. Um, we have self-contained accommodation on the cottages, so people are coming and going and, and we're enjoying that as well. But the impact of the tourists, tourists on the environment is also quite, quite full on. I mean, the bottom of the lake is terrible. We're, um, there's been a lot of freedom camping and, and things like that and they've done a lot of damage with uh, driving vehicles over very fragile land and making tracks and things like that. So it's not a, it's not a one industry, I mean we're all in this together. Um, but yeah, between the two, between the tourism and um, farming, uh, we seem to be involved in two of the high impact <laughs> industries. But also at the same time, it's fantastic to hear because you're also involved as a steward of the land and being able to share that story direct to tourism as well. Yes, and that is part of it. I do enjoy talking to the tourists um, and because we're on the Alps Ocean I'm now getting a lot of New Zealanders and Australians who actually do want to hear about the farming and, to, and it's nice to get them off the beaten track and actually coming down um, outside of the lake as opposed to just going straight through to Queenstown and Monica, which is what New Zealanders have done in the past. So um, and it's a good opportunity to share some of our farming heritage and the way we do things and why we do things because I think that's probably um, farmers are rational, we, do, we have reasons for, for why we do things and it's just a matter of making people understand some of the reasoning behind decisions. Uh, on decisions, another thing I found very interesting about Julia, she's a very inspirational lady, uh, is her involvement in the, what is called the McKenzie Trust and this was established I understand from previous governments uh, in how to make a strategic vision to protect the, the environment of the McKenzie Basin which is in hot uh, topic around this large-scale deer farm being planned and we spoke to Kerry Johnston from Ericon about that on last weekend's show. Uh, firstly could you give us some background on yeah. what was the McKenzie Trust and where it sits now? So the McKenzie Trust was formed out of the Shed Vision Agreement which was a collaborative process that took place in the McKenzie Basin about five or six years ago it actually finished. It took about three years of uh, negotiation between all the interested parties. Most of the NGOs, uh, uh, ECAN, the McKenzie District Council, the Waitaki District Council, local farmers, iwi, everyone was involved in, in that they tried to come up with a, a sort of a roadmap of what was appropriate and where in the McKenzie Basin to try and keep um, us all out of court so that we weren't litigating against each other and just to try and make life a bit easier for you know so there was some certainty around what what could and couldn't happen in the McKenzie Basin. Um, at the end of the, the agreement the, the agreement was signed by 22 parties and then it kind of went to sleep for a couple of years and then about two years ago the Associate Minister of uh, Conservation started the McKenzie Country Trust um, and I've been involved with it since then uh, and at the, we've done all the research work to get us up to date and, and we've just employed a GM who is working part time um, and recently a McKenzie Country report was done by John Hutchings and Hugh Logan in which they, the five um, government agencies asked for that report work to be done and that came out very strongly in support of the Trust as kind of a facilitator and an independent broker in this region to try and help um, smooth the way forward for people wanting to do things in the McKenzie. 
So I have to ask, what's the general rhetoric in the Mackenzie Basin about this particular farm as large scale dairy intensification? Um, it's not really something I want to particularly be drawn on, but um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, they have gone ahead and followed the right processes. Um, it's not necessarily something that we all agree with, um, but it's, I, from what I can understand, they have got all the right consents in place and it does appear that it will be going forward. It's um, unfortunate that it's bringing a lot of attention to the Mackenzie and attention from groups like Greenpeace, um, which is not particularly helpful to the rest of us. And where are you process your process? Excuse me. Where are you progressing at the moment with the current government? Uh, so we're meeting with Eugenie Sage uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we were supposed to meet last Friday, but she had to be in Wellington, and uh, so it looks like it'll be the end of June when we have the opportunity to meet with her. And that will be a very important meeting because basically the new government has to support the aims of the trust um, for it to be a viable entity going forward um, and not necessarily, I mean money is important obviously but it needs to be, it needs to have their full sort of uh, vocal support and them to actually believe in the goals of it so that we can go ahead. Um, we have got great support locally and great support from DOC and those sort of things so it's just we need to get the ministerial support so that we can forge ahead with our plans. Lastly, Julia, so you can ha go and have some lunch here at the Deer Industry Conference in Timaru this week. How important is conferences and coming together of shared knowledge between farmers? I think farmers love learning and um, we need to continue learning and it's really good to hear what's going on outside the farm gate because sometimes you can get very bogged down in um, what you're doing and and just your world can get a wee bit small so it's really good to come out and go to these sort of things so you have your horizons broadened, um, get to meet with other farmers and industry experts and get to listen to some quite inspirational